Hi there, I'm Bob Plankers. I'm a staff technical marketing architect at VMware Corporation, and it's my pleasure to do a deep dive on native key provider for you. Uh, we'll go through the introduction of it. We'll talk about its uses, VM encryption, VTPM, vSAN encryption, things like that. We'll talk about all the key providers, design, operation, tips and tricks, good ideas, bad ideas, all kinds of stuff. And so, yeah, let's get into it here. First off, I want to talk a little bit about my disclaimer. You know, I might be a little weird in that regard, but uh, disclaimer, it's a good opportunity to remind people that security is all about context. And what I think is a great idea for security might not be a good idea for your environment. Everyone's different and all solutions, security solutions are different. And so uh, my goal today is to arm you with a whole bunch of facts that you can use to decide whether or not this is a good idea for you and uh, how to how to go about securing your environment. If I will say, I'll put my marketing guy hat on too, if that uh, um, if you want a second set of eyes, we have VMware can help with that. Our professional services folks actually have a lot of experience designing and building secure environments, uh, doing audits and doing hardening and all kinds of stuff. So you, if you want a second set of eyes, reach out to your account team and they can get you hooked up. But take my marketing guy hat off. Let's talk about the features here for a little bit. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about with the agenda. Uh, we'll go through data at rest encryption features. We'll talk about the different key providers, uh, native key provider. We'll compare it to standard key provider. Standard key provider has been around since vSphere 6.5, along with VM encryption. And that's, uh, uh, you know, there's some different use cases there. We'll talk about resources, then I'll give you a link to Q&A. We've got 50 some odd questions out on core.vmware.com that probably answers whatever you're, whatever you're thinking about. And if it doesn't, you can leave me feedback and I'll put it in there. I'll answer it, answer it and put it in there for you. So anyhow, data at rest encryption features in vSphere. So first stop, the sort of original <coughs> encryption feature, data at rest encryption feature is VM encryption. It does exactly that, it encrypts VMs. And uh, it encrypts VMs right on the storage that they're sitting on. Uh, the VM has to be off while, while it's happening. Uh, it can be everything in a VM or it can be selective, just the configuration files or just an individual VMDK, however you wanna do it. VM encryption is licensed at enter the Enterprise Plus level, uh, but other things that use it, VTPM's native key provider, are actually licensed at all levels of vSphere. So you can turn on Windows 11, for example, you know, and so that's pretty cool. Speaking of VTPMs, that's the second thing. It's really, VTPM really is a form of VM encryption. It uses VM encryption to encrypt the secret. So a, a virtual trusted platform module is where a workload, a VM, will store its secrets. And we want to protect those on disks, on, on the disks, so that we can, well, so that they're protected, you know, and so we write them encrypted to the storage that they're on. And so when you turn on VTPMs, and I'll show you this in just a second here, uh, when you turn turn it on, it'll encrypt just the home files of the VM. So no problem there, but you do need a key provider, and that's where we're going with this. Last, and you can argue whether this is a vSphere feature or whatever, but hey, vSAN is pretty cool because it's delivered with vSphere uh, itself. Uh, data at rest encryption in vSAN, and it's seamless underneath everything. Um, it can be used by itself. It can be used in conjunction with VM encryption. If you want, a lot of people, you got to watch it a little bit because you'd be double encrypting. But for VTPMs, that's not a big deal, you know. But, I mean, you can go completely crazy and do BitLocker with VTPMs in uh, on VM encryption, on vSAN encryption, you know. But that might be kind of slow. Security is always a trade-off, and performance can be an issue as well with uh, full VM encryption. But I'm getting ahead of myself. At any rate, for VTPMs, if you want to go ahead and turn on a VTPM, what you do is you configure a key provider, and then you can go in, and once you've got a key provider, and this is a real-time recording, edit settings, you can go up to add new device, trusted platform module, and done. You know, you say OK, and then you'll, uh, my cursor will circle the VM configuration files are encrypted, no hard disks are encrypted. So no problem there. That actually works really well. And so the uh, um, very straightforward, you don't need to encrypt the whole VM. Don't check, don't change the storage policies or anything like that. You know, just do it this way and it's easy. 
So for vSAN, if you configure a key provider, you might see a trend there, configure a key provider. And then what you can do is you can turn on data at rest encryption. This is actually using the original storage architecture, the OSA. Uh, there's also the ESA, the Express storage architecture, which changes the rules about encryption a little bit. You need to do that before you claim the disks. But... Uh, um, but that's all right. I'll let the vSAN folks, uh, if you're if you're looking at it, uh, the vSAN folks, technical marketing folks have a bunch of materials on this as well. And so configure your key provider, flip that box, and it'll take care of things for you. Now, you might think there's a few things that we're going to cover here. You might think that wipe residual data, and this is a little detour, but you might think that wipe residual data is a good idea. But on a flash device, flash devices, every time you write to them, you wear them out a little bit. And they're really hard to sanitize, um, often impossible to sanitize, because they do over-provisioning, they do wear leveling, and they've got more capacity in them. So if you've got a 2 terabyte SSD, it's probably got 2.2 terabytes worth of storage in it. You just can't see that extra space. And so if you over, if you wipe the residual data, you know, will it erase everything on there? Mm, probably not. So before you do that to SSDs, definitely check to make sure that, uh, um, that it's going to do what you want it to do. Because it might not. It might just wear your SSDs out a little bit more, you know. And so sorry for the detour, but important safety tip. Uh, VM encryption, let's talk about that. So you configure a key provider, surprise, surprise, and then you can check the box. If you're creating a new VM, you can say encrypt this virtual machine and then pick the uh, uh, encryption storage policy. Or after the fact, if the VM is off, you can change the storage policy for it. You can add a, either a VM encryption policy to the whole VM or I mentioned that it's selective. You can flip that toggle, configure per disk, and then you can uh, select a different configuration of storage uh, encrypted storage profile for storage po policy rather for each of the objects so in this case we've got the configuration files the vm home files and you can see i'm changing it to vm encryption policy but if you want to do a, a encryption policy that's raid 5 or whatever you can configure these however you want it's pretty darn flexible anyhow like i was saying the secret sauce here is really that configure a key provider part and, uh, you know, and what do key providers do? Well, they provide keys. It's kind of like the car dealership. When I bought my truck, they provided me keys so that I could start my vehicle. You know, a key provider does exactly that. It provides the keys so that you can unlock a VM. And there's two keys involved. The key provider gets involved with one of them, and vSphere generates the other one on its own. And the one that vSphere generates on its own is called the data encryption key, the DEC, D-E-K. And uh, that is used to encrypt the VM objects themselves, VMDK files, configuration files, all of that stuff. And so, and then we write that data encrypted uh, data encryption key. We write that into the configuration file for the VM. Now you might think, hey, wait a second, Bob. That sounds like the dumbest thing ever. Why would you put the keys? It's like leaving the keys in my in the ignition of my truck, you know, uh, somebody can just come along and unlock it, right? You know, like that's not smart. Well, we're not that dumb. We have this, uh, we have something called a key encryption key. And uh, we use that to encrypt the data encryption key before we write it into the config file. And so the key encryption key, the data encryption key stays with the VM. And that's nice because as you replicate the VMs and, and back them all up and all that stuff, all of what it needs goes with it, except for the keys, which stay in our pocket or stay with the key provider. In fact, this arrow is, is uh, uh, pointing in the wrong direction. It should be going the other way around. The key provider provides them to us and stores them for us. We don't actually put them there. It's not a database. Well, it's a database of sorts, but it provides. It doesn't... Uh, yeah, it doesn't just store stuff. And so uh, the standard key provider, well, let's talk about the three different types of key providers. There's a standard key provider, which has been around since vSphere 6.5, and uh, uh, that connects out to a key management system, a KMS. 
Uh, key management systems can be big or small. They can be virtual. They can be physical. They can be uh, geographically dispersed. What they really need to be is highly available, and they really need to be, well, let's just put it this way. You don't want to be the person without the keys to your data, you know, just like losing the keys to a truck, you know, if you, then you can't start the truck. Well, you can't unlock something if you lose the keys. And so standard key provider, uh, the design of those key providers is really up to you and how, however you, you want to design it. Well, we ask customers, hey, why aren't you turning on uh, VM encryption? Why aren't you using these features? And this, a lot of them said, hey, it's hard. That extra complexity, maybe there's political stuff in organizations, whatever. They said, it would be great if vSphere could just take care of this stuff. And so in vSphere 7, we built the native key provider. And we, you can turn it on, create a native key provider instance, which we'll see in a minute. And you can use, you can start doing VM encryption, you can do VTPMs, you can do vSAN encryption, all of that stuff. Very powerful. The third key provider is really uh, in addition to the standard key provider. Uh, in vSphere 7, we, we introduced the vSphere Trust Authority, and the vSphere Trust Authority uh, basically ties access to cryptographic keys to having to host configuration. So if a host uh, is fully attested if it's got a TPM 2.0 in the host and it boots up correctly and isn't running malware and is in a good configuration, a, a, a well-known configuration, uh, then it can get access to the standard key provider through the, the trusted key provider configuration. Sounds complicated. Extra security, though. It's uh, If you're interested in it, just look up vSphere Trust Authority. But for now, we're just going to talk about the native key provider. Native key provider is cool. It's, you know, so you go in and, and you set up in the key providers. Or you can see both options here. Some caveats to it, some considerations. One, it only serves vSphere clusters. Uh, so that's important in two different ways. One, uh, the it only serves clusters. The host must be in a cluster. So if you've got standalone hosts, are you out of luck? No, just drop them into a cluster object and you can do it with a standard, uh, standalone host if you want but it only serves clusters. Two, it only serves vSphere. So if you've got a tape library somewhere or a storage array or something uh, that needs a key provider, needs a KMS, well, you can't use this for it. You're going to have to get a real KMS. And uh, there's pros and cons to real KMSs versus the native key provider. A native key provider is a real key provider. You know, it's production ready. Don't let me convince you otherwise don't let other people convince you otherwise it's production ready it's production grade lots of big customers are actually using it and we're we were actually very surprised by that and uh, they like it very much but uh, again we'll get to the use cases and the de more design considerations uh the native key provider doesn't have doesn't work quite the same way with the the dex and kex so there's still a data encryption key but the key encryption key actually is something that's generated by a key derivation function. And so you'll see us refer to something called a key derivation key, which is basically a random seed for that function. And so that's what you're creating. That's something that you create when you uh, create a native key provider instance. And so uh, d minor d details or whatever, but you'll see the terminology change there. And, and it's worth noting. Uh, but regardless, you know, there's still the data encryption key and then the key derivation key helps protect the data encryption key. Roughly the same process. Benefits, native key provider, you can turn it on right when you do an install and you can start encrypting. You never have to write. People ask us, uh, how do I go about sanitizing my disks? Well, you know, especially with SSDs, what we were just saying, they're very difficult to sanitize, if not impossible. And so the best way to, to sanitize your disks is just to never have written in the clear to them in the, to start with. And so uh, you can do that with Native Key Provider. Uh, you can, and so that's, that's really powerful. It's also flexible. These key providers, you can switch back and forth between them. If later on you decide you want to use a standard key provider, that's fine. Just configure one, and then you can do what's known as a shallow rekey to change the, the key encryption key into another key provider. So very straightforward. How it works. So we've got that key derivation key, and we don't like, at the vSphere level, we're very afraid of dependency loops, okay? Because vCenter server could be hosted, it's often hosted, inside the cluster it's managing right you know eventually you've got to do something like that otherwise you're going to be stuck and so 
we don't want a situation where we don't have the keys or the cluster doesn't have the keys and so it takes that key derivation key and it pushes it out to all the hosts in the cluster and so all of the hosts have the ability to decrypt data decrypt these uh, vms and unlock these vms on their own and so that's cool you know if you've got a vm here and we generate a data encryption key and we want to protect it the hosts can do all of that stuff by themselves you know but uh, there's some considerations there as well. But my point to this slide, too, is that vMotion continues to work. HA continues to work. And that's the big thing, too. HA needs to work because maybe vCenter server is the thing that was running on the host that failed. And so we want to be able to restart it somewhere. You know, standard key providers have got ways around all of that stuff, too. But the, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a different use case. And so we need to protect against that. Configuring native key provider, very straightforward. And again, a real-time recording of me setting one up. You go to key providers, you add, add native key provider. And we'll talk about naming. There's some tricks to naming. We'll talk about that in, in a minute or two here. Uh, I name it after the vCenter that I'm running it on right now. We're gonna, we have to talk about the checkbox too. There's important safety tips with that checkbox. But when you create it, it says it's not backed up. You have to back it up first. Uh, this is also a safety thing. You can give it a password. But if you don't back it up, this is the key to your car. You know, if you lose the key here, you're going to lose lose your access to stuff. And so that's not, uh, we want to make sure that you're protecting it. And you need to save this key in a, in a safe place because you might need it in the future. It's going to give it to you as a P12 file. And then you can go ahead and say, okay, that'll store it locally here. And then from there, you can go ahead and use it. So just like before, once you configure it, uh, you can go ahead and you can go add a VTPM. You know, no problem. And uh, VTPM, or Trusted Platform Module, and you say, okay, done. So I said I wanted to talk about a few things. One, I want to talk about names. Uh, naming collision. So uh, thing about native key provider, so standard key providers, you can configure the same key provider everywhere. Uh, and native key provider, you could actually do that as well. Key providers are found by their names. So if you encrypt a VM with a key provider called built-in, and you have built-in on all kinds of different vCenter servers, and it's not the same one, you're going to get a name collision, and th there might be problems. You know, so give it a good name. Don't have uh, those name collisions where you don't. You never want a situation where you've got two key providers that have the same name but have different data on the back end that's not cool you not that's not going to be a good day so give it a give it a good name you can export and import the key provider so if you if you want the same key provider everywhere and there's some there's some pros to that especially if you're going to do cross vcenter vmotion with encrypted vms which you can do but you have to have the same key provider in both places and so what you can do is you can take that backup file and just restore it at your dr site you can restore it in into other vcenters and then uh, uh, it'll all have the same name so name it wisely if you do name it poorly as I have done, like built in, for example, is a bad name, and I started with that. Um, what you can do is you could create another native key provider uh, and you could set it as the default, and then you can re encrypt. You can use PowerCLI to trigger a shallow rekey, or you can use the re encrypt VM policy option here to uh, to do that as well. And so, uh, not an insurmountable problem, just a speed bump, that sort of thing. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that checkbox. Use key provider only with TPM protected e ESXi hosts. TPM protected hosts. So TPMs, trusted platform modules, physical ones. I know I mentioned the virtual ones, but physical ones, they look like this. Here, can you see it? See that? They're about the size, the end of my pinky finger here. They're tiny. They're about $50, and you should put them in all of your all of your servers. Don't buy a new server anymore without one of them. Uh, windows can use it, all that stuff, you know, if you're still installing physical windows, physical Linux can do that, but ah, we don't install physical OSs like that anymore. ESXi can store its secrets in, in one of these though. And so if you've got hosts with those, that's great, but a lot of places don't have hosts w with TPMs. No worry, you can still use native key provider. But uh, uh, if you check this box, so if you check this box, it'll only deploy the key derivation key to hosts that have a physical TPM. 
Well, if your hosts don't have a physical TPM, it won't deploy it there. It'll look like it worked. Uh, it'll say that it worked, but you'll get weird errors like TPM2 device not found, stuff like that. And you'll say, Bob, this isn't as easy as, as it was. Well, did you check that box? Uh, another hang up that people have is maybe they've got uh, a cluster, like let's say there's 16 nodes that are older servers and 16 nodes that are newer servers and the newer servers have TPMs and the older ones don't. Well, if you check this box, only the TPM enabled hosts will get native the native key provider configuration. The other ones will throw errors and can't participate. And so that could be a problem too. So only check this box if you've got a homogeneous configuration there. All your hosts have got TPMs. And here's the secret. If your host has got a TPM and you don't check this box, it'll still use the TPM. It, uh, anytime ESXi has got access to a TPM, it'll prefer it for storing secrets. And so it'll it'll do the right thing regardless. Yeah, just watch, watch checking the box is all. You can tell that uh, we've run into this problem a couple of times. The key provider, the export file, the backup file, uh, has um, the uh, build uh, has the name of it. And actually, that's the fix, by the way, for if you check this uh, TPM box and it's not working, just delete the key provider and restore it from backup and don't check that box. So easy, very flexible. I'm very proud of our engineering staff for uh, building such an easy thing to use. Uh, so you've got that backup P12 file and that's great. You should store that in a safe place. The safe place that in an emergency you can get to if you need to restore things. vCenter server backups will also have the key derivation key in, in them as well. You should already be doing, uh, your vCenter server backups to a secure location because it's got all kinds of secrets in it. It's got, uh, logins and all of that stuff. And now it's got this key as well. And so uh, just another thing to think about. I mentioned the one native key provider instance for everything or individual ones. If you're going to do, like I said, if you're going to do cross vCenter vMotion, you might want it to be the same everywhere. The downside to that is if it gets compromised somewhere, then you're going to have to change it everywhere. But that's automatable. You just do the shallow rekey. You create another one and just do the shallow rekey, that sort of thing. So uh, um, up to you. It's a valid use cases either way, and there's pros and cons. Some other design considerations. I already mentioned a couple of these, you know, not a KMS. Uh, it's not a key management system. It's got different functionality and different guarantees. Uh, it can't rekey while you're cloning. So with a standard key provider, if you clone a VM, it will rekey the clone so that they're different. They've got different encryption keys. You know, and that's all right. You know, like it just it makes the clone not an exact clone, but the it doesn't really matter. Uh, with native key provider, you will get an exact clone. If you don't want them to have the same encryption key, you need to do a deep rekey on the the cloned VM afterwards. It's just a workflow thing, but it's something to keep in mind. The biggest thing, though, is that the keys are local. That key derivation key has been pushed out to the physical hosts, stored in a TPM, perhaps, or whatever. But if somebody steals that host, they're going to be able to unlock the vSAN data store that's encrypted, the VMs, all that stuff, because all the secrets went with it. you know. And so that's the downside to these TPMs, these physical TPMs, is all the secrets are right there. They're hard to get the secrets back out of. But, you know, it, but if you steal the whole host, you just turn it back on again. And so that's one of the biggest things to think about. You know, when you're considering what to, whether you should do a standard key provider, which has an external KMS, or the native key, to, key provider, there's a few things there. And so native key provider, let's go through the, the two of them. Let's com compare. Native key provider is supported and available in all license levels of vSphere. So you can turn on vTPMs and native key provider, all license levels. Welcome to Windows 11, whatever you want to do there. That's cool. Other things, vSAN encryption, VM encryption require other licenses. I think the advanced vSAN, uh, VSAN license, don't quote me on that, uh, and uh, Enterprise Plus for VM and encryption. Uh, 
A standard key, key provider does require a third party KMS system, and that does KMAP, you know, and that's you're on your own. Our, you're on, we can help you design it, sure. You're on your own picking one out, uh, though the VMware compatibility guide has got uh, partners listed in it that are compatible and things. And so, pick one, design it well, uh, make sure that it's reliable, please. Native key provider only serves vSphere, whereas standard key providers can talk KMAP to whatever and often have a lot of extra functionality as well. Native key provider and standard key providers work with all of these technologies, vSAN, VM encryption, VTPMs. Native key provider is designed to avoid dependency loops, whereas the standard key provider, I was just talking about this, uh, you need to avoid dependency loops. You shouldn't, if it's a virtual KMS, you shouldn't place it on the data store. You, turns out you can vmotion it onto the data store it's protecting that's not a good idea um, you know not that we're bitter about it people that have done that in labs and things but uh, um, it does require a little bit of design effort to mitigate loops and things and dependencies native key provider all hosts can participate and they can decrypt vms directly whereas a standard key provider a VM and the standard key provider is proxied via vCenter server. So VM encryption, uh, v, vCenter server is in the critical path to retrieving things from the KMS. And so every time a host reboots, it will re-retrieve keys through vCenter server from the KMS. vSAN, vSAN encryption, because of dependencies, uh, actually knows how to speak directly to the KMSs and the key, the key provider and so it'll go straight out to the KMS but uh, um, that network connection is important because that's actually a safety thing if somebody steals the host the host is as long as the host lost power it's not going to have and as long as you've got firewalls in front of your key, your standard key provider your KMS it's not going to be able to retrieve those keys again so something to think about can't rotate keys while cloning, can rotate keys while cloning with a standard key provider. And then, like I was saying, uh, stores decryption keys in the host, whereas a standard key provider, they're just cached in host memory. And so if an attacker steals a native key provider enabled host, they can uh, decrypt. They've got all the capabilities to decrypt anything that was used in that na native key provider. However, the standard key provider, if the host loses power, it'll lose all of its cached uh the KEX, the key encryption keys, and it'll need to reconnect to the KMS again at boot. So again, you know, it comes down to physical security. If you're, if you've got a retail environment or a branch office or something where you can't guarantee physical security, you might want to think about a, a standard key provider. If you've got an environment that you've got physical security covered in other ways, maybe a central data center, maybe you're a, f a federal agency that has a lot of firearms, for example, you know, and you're not so worried about it, you know, hey, whatever, you know, but that's where you kind of have to pick on your own. And uh, that's, uh, remember, we talked about security is all about context, right? Well, you know, we get people asking too, can't you do something about that? You know, can't you, uh, how do we, how do we mitigate that? We want to use native key provider, but can we mitigate these, these issues? You know, what about system hardening? Well, system hardening is a great idea in general. Good root passwords, lockdown mode, follow the security configuration guide, please. Uh, and, but here's the thing. Uh, it's... And that's, you know, system hardening is part of the fabric, the, the defense in depth of weaving all of the security together. But it's kind of a grim thought, but we have to assume that we're not done finding vulnerabilities in ESXi. And so that an attacker who steals a host might be able to wait in, until there's a vulnerability that they can exploit, you know, and they can recreate a network segment in their lab or whatever to be able to access and break into ESXi. And so we hope that isn't the case, but as security minded people, we have to be open to the possibility of it, you know, and software, software, software. So system hardening, good idea, but we, yeah, you get a, if you, if the keys are there, they're potentially vulnerable. We can't have a network dependency. There's a lot of organizations that don't like the standard key provider because there's a dependency on the network, especially in branch offices and robo sort of environments, that sort of thing. Uh, that's a people and process thing. Work out, work it out so that the network equipment comes up first and before vSphere comes up 
and you'll be okay. You know, it's a, I, I, all environments are different, but I know some large retailers that have worked that out and are actually pretty successful with it. Well, we'll add a TPM. That's great. I definitely urge adding TPMs to everything, but again, the secrets are still stored on the host. So you, uh, um, somebody steals the host, you're gonna, they're gonna get the secrets there too. Well, what about putting a vCenter server in a central data center? Well, remember that vCenter server is just only one component. That key is pushed out to all the hosts as well. And so not going to be, you know, good idea, but not going to be super helpful here. Well, what about a feature enhancement? Can we build it? Can we build the, the feature so that it can do this? Well, we'll just turn native key provider into a standard key provider then. So, and we have that and it works well. And so, um, we're always open to feedback and we get a lot, this is not to discourage feedback. It's just, we've heard a lot of these things and uh, it's a good opportunity to talk about some of these, some of these other things, uh, system hardening, especially. And, and, uh, so I appreciate it, but yeah. So to recap, basically a native key provider, again, lose the keys, lose your data. So save the backup keys. Um, and to reiterate it again, you know, like uh, I made comparisons to my truck, losing the keys to my truck. But the, the thing is, actually, I've got more recovery methods for my truck if I lose my keys than I do if we lose the, the uh, encryption keys for data encrypted in vSphere. There's no backdoors. Backdoors are just used by attackers. And so we don't build backdoors. And this is actually, there's some compliance, uh, regulatory compliance frameworks that have questions about being able to recover the keys. And we're like, heck no, you can't do that. You know, that's a bad idea. And so... Uh, you can export and import the keys between vCenter servers. This is great for DR environments and replicated environments. It's also great if you're going to do uh, cross vCenter vMotion. You can vMotion. Uh, all this stuff works great with encrypted VMs. So vMotion, HA, DRS, all that stuff. You know, cross vCenter vMotion works if you've got the same key provider in both locations. Choose a key provider name well because you might need to import it somewhere else and you don't want a name collision. Uh, secure your vCenter server file-based backup and restore. We talked about that. You should be doing that anyhow, but it's a good reminder. And then again, mind the physical security of your host. And to me, that's the, that's the biggest pivot there. You know, that's the biggest question is, is the physical security of hosts. Uh, are they f fairly physically secure? Because the native key provider could be a really good option for you. Other resources. I would be remiss if I didn't mention in any of my security videos and materials, please sign up for the security advisory mailing list. Uh, you know, we, the VMSAs, we email this list the moment a new VMSA is published. It, we aren't going to use it for marketing. We don't use it for marketing. We are forbidden for you from using it for marketing. You will never get a marketing email on this list. Uh, it, I often call it the most negative mailing list that VMware has because it's on, only going to send you bad news, but that's bad news that you need to hear so that you can protect yourself, you know, cause that's the thing. We can't tell the good folks of the world something without telling the bad folks of the world the same thing. The attackers always get to hear all of it. Us defenders are at a, uh, you know, uh, we, us defenders don't have any secrets from the attackers and that kind of stinks. So. Uh, and one of the things I always enjoyed, uh, well, one prevention is a matter of time, you know, and so getting on security advisories right away is important. And, uh, but I always enjoyed knowing about the stuff before my infosec folks showed up, you know, and asked me, Hey, Bob, have you seen? Yes. We, in fact, sometimes we'd even patched for it already. I love that. Anyhow, I digress. Uh, I mo spoke about the hardening guides, the security configuration guides. Check them out. A lot of good advice there. It's the baseline security guidance for vSphere. Uh, can you do more above and beyond that? Yeah, you can, you know, uh, but uh, this is good advice for hardening your stuff. And it's industry standard at this point. It's been around for many, a couple of decades now. Core.vmware.com has got all kinds of stuff on it. It's got uh, core.vmware.com slash security slash compliance slash ransomware. Uh, the cloud infrastructure security configuration guides are, uh, that page isn't just the guide. It's got other things about TLS, cipher suites and ports and protocols and firewall helpers and all kinds of stuff there. And so hopefully you can find whatever answers you're looking for. Speaking of questions and answers, I'm not going to answer too many here. I, I covered a lot of the common questions and situations 
just talking here. Yeah, you might have caught on to some of them. Pardon me, some of them. But uh, I've got a whole frequently asked question. Pardon me, a whole frequently asked questions list up on core.vmware.com. This QR code, you can scan it. You know, I'm not afraid of QRs. This QR code, it's even worse, actually. This QR code takes you to a redirector that takes you to core.vmware.com. But if you go to core.vmware.com slash security, you can get there anyhow. But anyhow, I appreciate you. Thank you for sticking around for 36 minutes or so. I hope I answered some questions for you. Uh, if you're viewing this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get notified when there's new videos and things like that. Uh, I could be a YouTube star and tell you to ring the bell, you know, so you get the notifications and that. We do appreciate you subscribing to the stuff, and we appreciate you as a customer. I hope you're staying safe and secure, and good luck to you. Thanks. Take care.